So we've done studies at UCLA using, using mindfulness techniques, one way of teaching a way to monitor and modify internal states. And even in preschool kids, using certain very basic mindfulness techniques, we've been able to show that you can decrease bullying. You can increase empathy. You can increase the capacity for kids to pause before they act. We've even done a pilot study at UCLA where if you teach mindfulness techniques, which I'll tell you about in a moment, you actually can take people with attention deficit problems where they can't regulate energy information flow, and you can actually, as adults and older teenagers, you can change the way their executive functions of their brain function just by teaching them mental training. So what I'd like to do is dive deeply with you into this notion of once we have a de definition of the mind, can we define a healthy mind? And then look at a way of thinking about this and think, well, how does this work in our personal lives? How does this work in a life where you're involved in energy and information transfer around the globe? How does it work in the interface between a human being and a computer? These are all relevant areas where understanding how you see the mind and defining the mind may be of benefit. So the first thing we'll say is that in common neuroscience, there's a statement that you may have read about, which is, the mind is just the activity of the brain. How many of you have heard that? Yeah. Okay, so if you read, if you read any of the really well-regarded neuroscientist writers who either write their um, research papers or write for the general public. This is basically what's said. And I'm going to suggest to you that that view is only part of the story. That instead, uh, we can think of a triangle where there are three points on this triangle. One point is the brain, the extended nervous system distribu distributed throughout the whole body, which can be thought of as a mechanism by which energy and information flow. Then there's the point of relationships which is where there's a sharing of energy and information flow. And then there's the point of the mind, which is the process that regulates this flow. And these three points on the triangle have arrows going in all directions. So unlike what you might read if you read common neuroscience books, where the arrow is one direction, these arrows in all directions. And it's not even as simple as just there's the mind and the brain. You can't understand human experience, I'll have you consider, without thinking about relationships. Certainly my own background as an attachment researcher and a psychiatrist, we see this all the time, that relationships shape the firing in the brain, and when neurons fire, they actually change their synaptic connections with each other. And so the way we learn, the way we grow, the way we develop, is by experiences in addition to genes shaping the synaptic connections in the nervous system. We know that relationships shape those connections. So it would be way too simplistic to say, as some scientists do, uh, that genes explain all of how someone develops. I mean, I don't know why those scientists say it, because it's actually proven not to be true. Eric Kandel won a Nobel Prize in 2000, showing, in fact, that the way experience works is it changes the synaptic connections in the brain by harnessing the power of genes, for sure, but by experience directly. So what we have here then is the notion that these arrows are going in all directions. Now, relationships can involve all sorts of sharing of energy and information. You may have had relationships with your teachers in school, um, which just talk about ideas and concepts and facts and externally based things. <clears throat> or you may have had relationships which are more involving, which you feel really understood by your teacher. Uh, you really feel your internal world is seen by them. And those two kinds of relationships on a broad spectrum are profoundly different. And they activate different parts of the nervous system, which we're going to talk about now. So let's dive deeply into the brain, the extended nervous system, so you can get a feeling for where we're at now in terms of neuroscience informing us about the mind and what a healthy mind might be. And I'll start this by um, first giving you uh, an overview of brain anatomy, and then we're gonna look at a particular clinical case uh, to understand um, how the mind is influenced by the structure of the brain. So Meng has been really nice enough to 
um, hand out a model of the brain that's underneath each of your seats. So if you reach down below your seat and pull your hand out, <laughs> you pull your hand out, it's attached to your wrist, that's may not range that too. If you take your hand out and put your finger in the middle, this is a very handy model of the brain. <clears throat> you, you don't have to ever remember to bring it to work. So if you put your thumb in the middle and then curl your fingers over the top, this individual's face would be in front of the fingernails. The metaphoric brain we have here, the top of it would be the top of the fingers, that's where the top of the skull would be. The back of your hand would be where the back of your skull is over here. So, taking the brain apart piece by piece, if you raise your fingers up, lift your thumb up, let's start uh, the uh, anatomy lesson here. The spinal cord uh, brings in data from all over the body um, and first enters the skull part of the skull-based brain in an area called the brain stem. And this is an area that helps regulate your basic physiology, like heart rate and respiration. Um, but it also has the nuclei, the collection of the basic cell of the nervous system, the neuron, um, that are responsible for the fight, flight, freeze response. Okay? And that area of the brain stem um, works closely with the next area. The, this is called the triune model or three-part model. If you put your thumb over, you'd have two thumbs. It would be ideal, but most of us just have one. Um, this thumb represents the part that evolved when we became mammals hundreds of millions of years ago. It's called the limbic area. It's involved in five processes and it works closely with the brain stem. Those five processes include appraising the significance of events that happen. So if you're on a computer program, for example, and you feel not really compelled, you, your limbic area is probably not saying that's important, pay attention. So appraisal is number one. Number two is motivational states. It works very closely with the brain stem in motivating, motivating us to do certain things, to behave in certain ways. Okay. Number three is it distinguishes between different kinds of uh, memory systems. Uh, number four is it also works closely with the brain stem and the body to generate what are called emotions or affective states or sometimes called valenced states of mind, emotions. And the fifth thing that the limbic area does that people often don't realize, but if you raise rats or mice or if you raise amphibians and, and uh, like frogs or, or newts or you raise lizards, you know when we developed a limbic area as mammals, we also developed another really important function and that's the function called attachment relationships. So the limbic area is important for us having relationships with other people that are, that are not only close and meaningful, but when we're in a state of distress, we go to that attachment figure to help soothe us. So here you see from 200 million years ago, we as mammals have needed each other to survive. We've needed each other to help regulate our energy and information flow. We are, as a class of animal, mammals, extremely social. Okay? So that's the limbic area, the fifth function of limbic area. Now since these are all below the cortex, they're called subcortical. When we also developed our mammalian uh, ancestors long ago, developed the cortex, the neo-mammalian cortex, the newer part of the brain. It's the outer bark of the brain. It's actually really thin. It's only six layers thick. Um, and it has lots of folds, these convolutions that make it look thicker on a, uh, on a scan. Um, and it has two huge areas, easy to remember, back and front. The back has several lobes, like the occipital lobe, parietal lobe, we don't need to worry about that, but the, the back in general is for processing the external world. When you see me moving my hands around like this, right, we know it's the back of your brain that's being activated. When you hear the sound of my voice coming from outside of you, we know it's the side of your brain, the temporal area. Even when you feel with your fingers like this, you're activating still a back part of the brain because you're exploring the outer world. Okay, So that's the posterior part of the brain. Once you get from your second to last knuckles forward to the fingernails, that's the frontal area of the brain which grew when we became primates. And this area has energy and information flow in it that in the first part is about your motor action, what you're going to do with your body in response to your experiences. And the next strip just before that is called the premotor strip. It's where you plan your actions, where you image what you're going to do. 
as you keep on moving forward in the brain, which is called anteriorly, as you keep on moving forward, and I don't know if there's a computer analog to this, but in the brain, there, the way it works is the more forward you move, the more complex the representations. A representation is a cluster of neural net firing patterns that stand for something, obviously, other than the neural net firing pattern. So in the back of the brain, you might have a representation, let's say, of my hand here and moving here and moving here. So you're representing the visual image of my hand. But in the front of the brain, you can have a representation of something like freedom or justice or mental health or awakening. The back of the brain doesn't know what to do with those kinds of things. You know, they're really far from solid stuff, but the more forward you move, the more abstract the representation gets. Once you get to the prefrontal area, 